Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar this afternoon. Um, the webinar is called Supporting School Health Services, Public Funding, and Other Key Issues. Um, we have a lot to cover, so we're going to get started. First, a couple quick housekeeping items. Um, if you're having trouble with audio, so you might not be able to hear me at this moment, um, sometimes it is helpful to call in using your phone. So the number is on the screen, so hopefully if folks can't hear me, they can see it on the screen. Also, a, a note that our webinar is being recorded, and we will be sharing the recording and the slides with everyone that registered for the webinar. Um, and then the last, if you have any questions that come up throughout the webinar, please feel free, feel free to type them into the chat or question and answer box. On my computer, that is to the right of the slides. Um, so feel free to put those in there as they come up. And myself and my co-presenter will do our best to answer those questions um, throughout the presentation, um, and we, will ho we hope to have time at the end to answer as many questions as we can. With that, um, you, you're hearing from me. My name is Lisa Eisenberg. I'm the policy director with the California School-Based Health Alliance. And I am um, so pleased to be joined today um, by Santoy Trotter, who is a program manager for school-based behavioral health with UCSF Benioff Children's Hospitals. Hopefully you know who we are at the California School-Based Health Alliance. You signed up for our webinar, so hopefully you know us. Um, but if you don't or if you're, you're new to our organization, we are the statewide um, advocacy and nonprofit organization um, that's dedicated to improving health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in schools. And we have a lot of web resources on our website, so please feel free to check us out with, for more information on our website. Before we, um, Santoy and, I, and myself, dive into the content that we want to share with you this afternoon, I want to quickly cover some learning objectives and set some expectations and go over the agenda. So, you know, there's a lot to cover when it comes to school-based mental health, and so I. I our webinar is very much going to be a high-level overview of school mental health best practices, um, considerations, and public funding sources. This is not by any means meant to be comprehensive. I think we do three-hour pre-conference workshops on this topic at our conference. Um, we, have multiple, we do multi-series workshops on this, so this is one webinar that's going to cover a lot of different um, topics at a very high level. Um, and we're, we're not going to have the time to do a deep dive into, that, into any of those topics. But that said, we hope you take away um, an overall understanding of what it means to, to, do, to implement a trauma-informed school mental health program, what, um, to identify two best practices for program development and clinical care, and um, the third is identify public funding streams that can be leveraged to sustain this trauma-informed school mental health practice or model that we're going to be covering. And with that, I am so pleased um, to turn it over to my co-presenter, Santoy, who will provide an overview um, of school-based behavioral health and the work she supports in Oakland. Following Santoy, um, I will then cover some public funding sources that can be leveraged to support this work. So let me turn it over to Santoy now. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate that. And good afternoon, everyone. I am so glad to be with you this afternoon and to share with you a little bit about school-based behavioral health. I feel honored to witness um, an amazing clinical team uh, do this work every day um, and have been kind of there with them for the past 14 years in Oakland. Uh, so there's a lot to talk about, as Lisa said. I'm going to just focus on four different areas today. One is rooted in health equity, um, talk about trauma-informed treatment and interventions, speak with you about our comprehensive school-based behavioral health model that we're here to serve the whole school, 
And finally, end with um, something I feel incredibly excited about is partnering with young people on a school campus as a resource um, in promoting school-based mental health and school mental health overall. But to start with, I'd like to just give you some context. Um, we know that uh, place matters, uh, that race plus place, what your zip code is, um, is one of the strongest indicators of what your health outcomes might be. Um, again, I share that we're located in Oakland and it's one of the most diverse cities. There are you know, over 64 languages spoken in the homes of OUSD, Oakland Unified School District students. Um, it's a home of Port City, um, as well as a million redwood trees, um, and also home uh, history of activism and community activism and resilience. We are home of the Black Panthers. Um, we are for our community that is impacted by uh, structural oppression, historical racism, uh, community violence. If you look on the slide in the deep red spot at the bottom there is uh, East and West Oakland, where our school health clinics are located, um, and the red indicates uh, gun violence kind of in those communities. And um, Castlemont High School, one of the schools that we serve, as you see um, this health disparity here, if you're born at Castlemont High School or nearby there, that you have a 12 year less um, life expectancy than a child born in nearby Piedmont. And so our work is um, to you know, address those health disparities. And I feel fortunate that there are two pioneers in health that started our health centers. One is Dr. Barbara Staggers, who uh, is um, a role model of mine and opened up our adolescent clinics and also a pioneer in adolescent health in our hospital. Um, and as well as Dr. Sue Park, who is a psychologist and really through the sheer power of uh, and strong relationship skills um, really did so much to build the foundation of our school-based behavioral health program. And together, the two of them really rooted the beginning of our school health programs in cultural accountability, uh, cultural humility, humility, as well as the importance of relationships. Here you have a picture of the doorway of our McClyman's West Oakland Health Center and what we all know so well is that, you know, young people and vulnerable communities need access to quality health care, but that access doesn't just mean having the health care next to or in a school even. Um, that one of the things that Dr. Parks and Dr. Staggers taught us is the power of relationships. That when we're bringing health care, whether it's medical health or behavioral health care to a school campus and to a community, especially when it's been impacted by trauma and stress, that we need to build those relationships uh, with our educators, with families, and with communities in order for them to trust us to access the services that we have to offer. So we all hear the term trauma-informed care, trauma-informed systems many times at this point. And I just wanna remember, you know, especially in this moment of the coronavirus, um, how we, respond to a public health issue and to remind us that stress and trauma is a public health concern uh, that we all have. And so behavioral health providers or mental health providers in school have a lot to do to support educators to realize the impact of trauma and stress on students, but not only on students, also on teachers, on administrators, on family members, and to be able to recognize what those signs and symptoms are, and to build into school practices, academic practices, um, build into the way the student enters into the school building, um, ways that actually respond by creating a safe environment um, in their policies and safety and predictability within the practices in the school day. And there's a lot of partnership that can happen if we all work together to actively resist re-traumatization. One thing lesson that we've learned is that we can no longer limit these interventions to single students um, when we're creating a trauma-informed plan, but that we really can, all students and all people in the school building will benefit when we apply uh, some of the trauma-informed principles to the whole school. And so 
I'd like to share some specific examples of the way our team, our clinical team has done this at the schools that we serve. And one example is that we had a learning community for the principal team. So the principals, the vice principals, and all the leaders at the school, there are about five of them, who participated in a healing schools consultation. And this was uh, for about six months, once a month for about an hour and a half. The principal and his leadership team came uh, to our schoolhouse clinics, and each month we would study one of the trauma-informed principals, as well as think about how they could apply that in their uh, school leadership. And I'm happy to say that that was about a year ago or two years ago now that we did that uh, learning community. And even just last week when there was a crisis that impacted the school community, uh, one of the leaders who had been a part of that, you know, responded by using uh, transparency, uh, quick communication, uh, making sure that everyone was informed. And some of the things that they had learned from uh, participating in that healing school uh, consultation group. We also want to make sure and support and partner with our educators uh, and have the teachers understand the impact of trauma and stress and how they apply that in their planning and in their classroom. And so to that end, we provide uh, PDs uh, at the beginning of the school year and throughout the school year for teachers. And we all know how hard it can be to get time uh, for professional development. And so um, some of that work is working again with the principals first, with the leadership, so that they understand the impact um, and that we're working uh, with aligned purposes and that they then allow for uh, professional development time for the educators to really understand trauma and stress and the impact on their classroom. And also to understand cultural humility and responsiveness uh, in their classroom, because we look at that from a trauma-informed lens. The other thing that we provide, have provided are wellness sessions for educators. So that might be a mindful session or um, a stretch and movement or aromatherapy, but really pulling from our clinical team maybe practices that they may do in session with clients and families, but sharing that with teachers. One work that I've been very glad to do is provide trauma and resiliency training for parents. And when that request first came actually from a West Oakland um, parent group, we thought what we were doing was providing trauma training to parents so that they can better understand their adolescents. And what happened in those trainings were actually such great self-awareness for parents and kind of the liberation that can happen when understanding the impact of your past experiences. Um, there was uh, a thing for many parents, the first time that they had some context to the experiences uh, that they had and how that has shaped uh, the way they respond in, in, in the world, both in their closest relationships with their spouses or with their children, um, but also at work in other places and to begin some of that healing. And so I was really glad to do that work. Um, the last piece here is providing in-class presentations for students. We want to do health promotions and actually work with students to provide those presentations for their peers. Before I go deeply into our uh, model of school-based health, I want to just point out that there is uh, a national model through the National Center for School Mental Health, and some of the SHAPE system, um, some of their quality assurance uh, items that they focus on are teaming, so like our cost process that we have here, uh, mental health promotion, screening, as well as needs assessment and resource mapping, and early intervention and treatment services. So I will speak to a few of those as we go on. Our comprehensive school-based behavioral health model and our schools include evidence-based and culturally responsive psychotherapy for adolescents and families. We provide on-call assessment for suicidal and any high-risk behavior same day. We also link to psychiatry services and also medical services through our school health center. And we provide tra training and consultation uh, to and with school staff, medical providers, and school partners. Just yesterday, um, we provided a training in collaboration with Alameda County on public charge and how it impacts our immigrant, immigrant students and families, uh, and that was for educators and providers. And then we also include peer health education and outreach. So just imagine, this is a wonderful slide that was created by my colleague, uh, Maria Mascueta, 
And when we receive a referral for a young person, let's call him Luis, uh, that maybe he got referred by the cost team um, for self-injury, sleeping in class, body attendance, and he was assigned a therapist. And that therapist does their comprehensive assessment and treatment planning in collaboration with Luis and decides that he might need benefit from some individual therapy to address uh, some of the trauma that he has shared uh, that he had in not only in his home country, but also in his journey uh, here to the United States. And uh, Maria also runs uh, every semester a trauma and acculturation group uh, that is based on some of the DBT skills that we teach, but also includes cultural practices uh, from the communities uh, that are served. And so she refers them as well to group therapy. While he's in individual therapy, we learn that Luis is, li you know, he's with living with his uncle, but his uncle's having a really hard time understanding why Luis isn't um, appreciating that he's opened his home and that he's feeding him. And also he knows that he needs to go to school, um, but that he really wants him to be working more. And so Maria would then, uh, or one of our clinicians, would do some family work with that uncle. And the teacher who's been working really hard is starting to get you know, frustrated with Luis. And she's done the referral and it's been two weeks and she's, she um, you know, has many students on her caseloads. And so another thing that Maria would do here is provide consultation to that teacher. Um, moving along is that we wanna make sure and support that there's uh, legal assistance, um, that there's some crisis management, and also that there's access to food. Uh, we have the benefit of being able to have a food pharmacy at some of our clinics. And so we wanna make sure that Luis and his family have access to food, which might uh, decrease some of the stress that uncle is having. And we may understand that Luis is having trouble sleeping uh, based on nightmares and um, some of his trauma symptoms. And so we decide to refer him to psychiatry and as well as uh, primary care. So that gives you a kind of a full picture of the services that we provide uh, in our behavioral health services. We want our treatment to be, again, evidence-based. Uh, many of the young people that are referred to us are more uh, moderate to severe, presenting with moderate to severe symptoms. Um, and we, um, a lot of times students say they want someone to talk to and we want to be able to provide that, but we also want to provide clinical, a high quality of clinical care so that we're seeing a change um, and a relief from the symptoms that they're experiencing. But we do know that we need these uh, evidence-based uh, services, whether it's DBT or trauma-focused CBT, to be culturally responsive in order for that young person, that family, to be able to um, be able to use the practices from their own community, right, um, and be able to use those coping skills uh, that they know that have worked for them or for their grandmother or for their uncle or their aunt, um, to be able to know that they have wisdom within their own culture and medicines within their own culture that we validate um, and that we want to make sure that they have access to. In all of our work, we're also addressing the social determinants of health and that we're also supporting a school-based behavioral health clinical team that we, even if I know in some communities, we may not have a whole team of therapists, but we do want to bring those therapists together. Uh, the consultation team is invaluable to the work and helps decrease vicarious trauma, as well as provide support for the clinicians. One of the evidence-based practices that we are implementing right now is DBT. One of the things we notice is that Many of our young people, regardless of di diagnosis, are um, one common theme is emotional regulation and dysregulation. And so we are uh, providing a second level um, behavioral health groups for students, um, which focuses on building skills to support emotional regulation and mindfulness. And one of the things we've learned in this implementation process is that we want the students to have these skills, but we also want to make sure that um, teachers have these skills and they can apply them in the classroom um, and bring them out, draw them out, um, that parents understand DBT and what that is, that principals understand. And so we're starting to do trainings um, and planning trainings for the whole school to understand DBT. I'm very excited about this. Um, many of the uh, 
oftentimes we get so many referrals we don't know what to do with. And now we can uh, better look at who needs the individual therapy treatment, but also um, for those who may be better served by skills group that they can have the good skills group. And that the whole school will have these skills as well and knowledge of these skills. I want to speak a little bit to student engagement and trauma-informed student engagement. Um, we want to make sure that young people are aware that they are in a clinical treatment. Um, so not, that doesn't stop with a parent signing a consent form. Um, that includes, you know, young person being aware of the assessment, being aware of a diagnosis, if we need to give them one for Medi-Cal and that they understand that, um, that they are involved in their care throughout the whole process and designing their care. I feel very happy, one of our clinicians shared the other day that a young person, I think of someone on the football team, pretty popular, was walking down the hall and saw the therapist walking down the hall with her badge and, you know, leaned over and said, are you a therapist? Uh, can I get therapy? You know, I've been wanting to talk to someone. Um, and I heard also that, you know, some of the coaches are starting to um, support their team members to access care and being able to destigmatize mental health services uh, will so much, you know, support communities. Um, one of the things that we know is that suicide rates for African American boys are, is on the rise. And if a young African American boy who's on a football team can see a therapist walking down the hall and say, excuse me, you know, I'd like to talk to someone, then I know that, you know, we're doing our job. Um, and at the same time, we want to manage confidentiality on a school campus, and that can be very tricky, um, that we know that we're walking down the halls with students and that people might have a therapist, um, but that we also make sure we're holding high standards of confidentiality and that we're not careful about where we're talking about cases, that we don't talk to students about other students. Um, that goes a long way in building trust in a school system. And we work really hard to engage families. Uh, we know that our families are multi-stressed, that they're impacted by historical trauma and their own interpersonal lived life experiences, um, and that we work to uh, make sure parents know that we respect them, that we um, understand and respect their struggles. Um, many times parents might not be able to respond to the first or second call or the reach out and that we keep reaching out to families, um, that we are part of registration, you know, as many of you are as well um, at the school, we go to parent open house night, um, we'll find parents wherever they are so that they know that we have these services and that we're building those relationships um, before maybe their young person is referred to services. And so when they are, that they know us, that they've had some contact with us. And that again, we're managing confidentiality and mandated reporting that sometimes there is often a, a, can be a break in the therapeutic relationship when we've had to report, but that we use transparency, that we let parents know when we and caregivers know whenever we do have to do a report so that we can have the best chance of rebuilding that relationship. I think the one other thing I'd like to share here is that we want to make sure that we're celebrating with families when there are successes. Um, so that we're there with them at graduation, we're, get, we're there with them when their young person um, starts attending classes and we help them celebrate um, even the small wins and small successes, um, that we know that those successes are uh, in large part because the family's there to support their young person. Um, and we think about family and caregivers in the broadest sense. Um, it may not be who you think is traditionally there to support a family, but we really want to be as broad and let that young person articulate and identify who their family is and who we, they want to celebrate with them. And again, we're working in deep collaboration uh, with school staff, with educators, with primary care, psychiatry, also social workers, probation officers, and coaches, um, that our work is not alone. Uh, we may need to get you know, 10 different information release forms signed in order to do this level of collaboration, um, but we do it because we know it, it goes better when we work together as a team. The other piece that we do is bridge uh, young people to resources. Uh, we may be aware of resources that the family, especially for our immigrant families, um, but even for our families that grew up here in Oakland, may not know what uh, resources that they can access to support uh, their child or to support themselves. And one example is connecting young people to internships, to work opportunities, um, that we have 
a way of addressing the social determinants of health. So that might be, we have um, in our clinic what's called Find Connect, uh, which helps uh, identify what uh, housing or food or other barriers uh, that families might be experiencing to their full health and connecting them to that. Um, we may support somebody with psychological testing and having access or connecting to regional center, but that we see at whether we're a psychologist or LCSW or MFT, that part of our work is to support families to have access to the resources that are here and available for them. So switching uh, to our clinical team, again, I shared at the beginning that I am honored to work with an incredible, excellent clinical team and just wanted to share with you all some of the things that we're looking for in a behavioral health clinician uh, when we have the opportunity to bring someone else onto our team. And one is an awareness of cultural humility and awareness that this is a lifelong process um, and that we are ac accountable to the communities that we serve. And as a team that we're willing to look at ourselves, um, to speak with, have hard conversations with each other around race and social justice and gender, sexual orientation, um, so that we can keep growing. Um, we're looking for folks who have a sense of youth development and child development um, have clinical skills and participate in case consultation. In our case consultation, it's a team that we provide on a weekly basis for all therapists, but we also, one thing that's unique to the Center for the Vulnerable Child is that we provide individual reflective supervision for every therapist, regardless of their licensure. And one of the reasons we do that is uh, we, again, respect their knowledge, but we wanna make sure that every therapist is supported and that we're reducing the impact of vicarious trauma and that we're providing ongoing training for our clinicians. And again, currently our ongoing training is DBT, um, but we've had ARC and other theoretical models that we've done deep dive in. Um, and one way we've recently addressed vicarious trauma is we took our clinical team to Lake Chabot um, to be in the water, to take a walk, um, to be in the trees and to be with each other and that um, some of the stress and trauma doesn't happen alone, and we don't want our clinicians I think we're having some technical difficulties. Um, Sanjoy, can you hear uh, can you hear me? Thank you for your patience while we um, troubleshoot. Let's give Santoy a couple seconds to redial in. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, great. Yes, Sorry. we can hear you. My phone. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, everyone, my phone dropped. Um, but just coming back, I'm back with you. Um, so I shared just, I hope you heard the part where we took our team to Lake Chabot, um, and that was a way of addressing vicarious trauma and supporting that we're healing, wanting to make sure that we're making time on a consistent basis to heal together. And Again, our goal is to promote the health of a whole school, so students, families, educators, um, and to support a healthy and safe community. And one way we do that is by knowing that young people are a resource and that we wanna partner with them. Um, our Chappelle Hayes Clinic in West Oakland actually was designed by young people, family members, community members, and one example of that is that we have a couch in our waiting room, and they wanted to replicate the sense of sanctuary, which was, a uh, closet that they had before we had a health center that uh, in uh, the school um, that was their sanctuary. And so they adapted the couch into our waiting room. And that's just one example is that we know that young people actually are, you know, they talk to each other first. And so we are working with young people as health, youth health advocates um, at our clinics um, where they are doing a lot of the health promotion work. Um, we want young people, we know that there can be peer health workers or peer counselors. I know the California School Health Alliance has a great model for 
um, peer health workers, and uh, young people can be youth health advance and advance ambassadors. And so currently, we have a group of young people who are seniors who recently just organized a um, group health visits in our health center for the 10th grade biology classes, and we're about to replicate that. And so just briefly, if there aren't any other questions, um, just wanted to share some words from some of the young people that have shared, um, they've shared with us, is that they feel that our school-based behavior helps, health center helps them build myself a stronger woman by example and conversation, that the school health center helps me manage my stress at home, fill out job applications and get connected to a psychiatrist. Um, they've helped me control my anxiety and not feel depressed. And again, uh, I feel so moved and grateful um, to be any part of building the resiliency and the hope of young people um, that we get to work with. And this is you know, one of the things that's possible in school-based behavioral health. Often we are restoring um, and working with young people um, to heal from a lot of the trauma and stress that they've experienced and their families and open up actually generations of healing. We have sometimes family members who bring in um, their younger sisters um, or parents who hadn't been open in the past but are now open to mental health treatment or behavioral health treatment. And um, so grateful to be a part of this work and to do this work. And now I'm going to turn it over to Lisa, who's going to talk about, well, how do we fund this? How do we get paid? How do we make this happen? Great. Thank you so much, Santoy, um, for your presentation. I feel like um, it was a little bit of a disservice to just squeeze it into half an hour, but I hope um, you all will forgive us. Um, there's, again, there we could do a multi-session series on um, all of those aspects. Um, but we wanted to start with that because just like Santoy said, it's how, what do these practices look like? What does a comprehensive school mental health trauma-informed work look like? What are the multi-facets to us? And now we are gonna take those trauma-informed practices and principles that Santoy shared, and how do we use those to inform our funding decisions and who we partner with um, to sustain um, our school mental health services. And there is no, there is not a one size fit all, fits all. Uh, your funding decisions are going to look very different based on who are your providers, your student demographics, your, the context of the community you're serving, just like your interventions and your practices and um, services will be informed by those same things. Before I get into the details of and provide an overview about what funding is, is available, um, I wanted to cover three funding principles. And I'm, I've keen them trauma-informed. How are we taking our trauma-informed lens to, to think about our funding decisions? Um, so the first one is mental health resources reach all students. And the goal in making funding decisions um, is to sustain services in all three tiers for a comprehensive school-based mental health. So I think one of the strategies around that is how do you leverage um, restricted funding, which in many cases is Medi-Cal, as best you can to meet the intensive needs of students. Um, and I think one of the things that Santoy shared with me as we were preparing for this webinar is um, oftentimes your intensive needs the, there is a lot of need for intensive services when you are serving um, some communities that might have intense experiences of trauma or a, or a lot of experiences of trauma. So your pyramid might not look like one of those pyramids. It might be flipped a little bit. On the flip side of that, how are you leveraging flexible funding to support the other services that we know work, like the peer health educators, um, creating sanctuary spaces, consulting with teachers, a lot of that work that goes into and creates the bed to build upon these practices. Um, so how are you making funding decisions that help you reach all students to some extent? The second principle is comprehensive school mental health programs require strong partnerships between school staff and community providers where everyone identifies as the resources to bring to the table. So everyone has a role in thinking about um, what funding they have access to and what funding they have leverage to and how it can 
you can piece the puzzles together to create a continuum of services. Um, so I, I often think, I often say schools can't do it on their own. Um, a lot try and do, um, but we really encourage schools um, to, to not think about how they are doing this on, this on their own, and also the community providers, whether you're a county, whether you're a federally qualified health center, whether you're um, a community mental health agency, a hospital, how are you, you, you can't build a comprehensive system on your own, so how are you leveraging your school partners? And the final one, which I think is really important to the conversation we're having today, is that in reality, a lot of funding sources that we are really enthusiastic to draw down and leverage may run counter to the trauma-informed and healing center goals that we set forth in our programs. Um, a lot of the funding streams, particularly Medi-Cal, um, that sustain school mental health services you could argue are inherently untrauma informed. They require diagnosis, they require screenings, only certain types of providers um, can provide these services. So how, a lot of those requirements set up structures that um, you have to figure out how to delicately knit into um, a comprehensive program. Um, so those are three funding principles um, that I, I, I think are important to hold onto as we learn and think about what are the opportunities, what are the funding opportunities. Um, so on the slide in front of you um, is an overview of the various public funding streams I'm going to talk about. Um, many of these funding streams can be used in various ways. Um, the intention behind laying these funding streams on top of this pyramid for school mental health is to organize them in a way where I think they can be used most strategically. How do you draw down funding stream that, that is more restricted in certain ways, and how do you use more flexible funding to build out your services around those more restricted funding streams? Um, so first, I'm going to cover the three funding streams on the right side that are um, mostly controlled at the county level. And then after that, I will cover the funding on the left side. Um, and those are streams that are, quote unquote, mostly controlled by school districts or the state education system or county offices of education um, or, ed or various education partners. Um, so again, these can be used in various ways. How you make these decisions is going to depend a lot on your student population. Um, and again, and, and finally, it's, this is a very quick overview. Um, I will have a resource with a link to it at the end that, that dives into each of these funding streams in more detail. And I, and I think the intention of covering these really briefly is to help you, is to lay, raise your level of understanding about some funding streams that you may be less familiar, familiar with. So you might sit in the county or a community provider where you understand Medi-Cal really well, but you're less familiar with the school side or vice versa. So that's really the intention is to bring everyone's um, understanding up a bit. All right, um, so the county funding streams. Um, the first two funding streams are Medi-Cal. And to give some general background, um, low-income children under 20, 21 enrolled in Medicaid in California, we call Medicaid Medi-Cal, um, are entitled to comprehensive and preventive health services under a federal entitlement called Early Periodic Screening, Diagnosis, and Treatment. This covers everything from mental health to physical health visits to vaccinations and, and more. Uh, about 50% of California children are eligible for Medi-Cal, so we have a big population of eligible children. Mental health in Medi-Cal is carved out into two separate systems. You have county specialty mental health and you have mild to moderate mental health. Um, so for starting with county specialty mental health, Oftentimes, this is referred to as EPSDT funding or services. That's a little bit of a misnomer, misnomer because EPD, EPSDT covers all the, all the services that Medi-Cal Medi children are entitled to, 
not just their specialty mental health services, um, but oftentimes if you hear EPSDT funding, people are often referring to the Medi-Cal behavioral health funding, mental health funding that's, um, that counties are responsible for. Uh, as I mentioned, this funding is uh, managed by county departments of mental or behavioral health, our, our, our state sub, like sort of basically subcontracts to counties to serve the Medi-Cal students or Medi-Cal youth in each county. Um, it is meant to co cover moderate to severe mental health needs. Um, and for someone, whether you're a school, whether you're a community provider, whether you're a federally qualified health center, to get reimbursed um, for school-based services, um, you have to contract with a county. So oftentimes co counties will contract with um, community-based providers to deliver these services. And I believe UCSF, UCSF Children's, Benioff, Benioff Children's Hospital is a contractor for these services. So that's an example of how this work in Alameda County happens. The other half of the Medi-Cal mental health benefit is um, considered Medi-Cal mild to moderate. So this is a fairly recent change in California. Um, Medi-Cal managed care health plans um, are responsible for serving a variety of health needs for their enrollees. Um, and Historically, this has been primarily primary care, physical health care needs, and our state recently added, recently, a couple years ago, added the mild to moderate mental, emotional, and behavioral health benefit. So Medi-Cal managed care plans, and this might be a Kaiser in your county, this might be, um, I'm blanking on names <laughs> off the top of my head, this might be a Kaiser, this might be a Molina, this might be an L.A. Um, LA Care, um, the Medi-Cal health plans look differently in different counties. Um, and so they are now responsible for a mild to moderate mental health benefits. Counties are still historically and still currently provide a bulk of the mental health treatment for youth. Um, the categories between mild to moderate for young people and moderate to severe for young people is, has been harder to distinguish between counties and Medi-Cal health plans than it is for adults. So this is, it's a fluid system as, you know, if you're a provider serving the community, you can understand how mental health in that moderate area might not easily separate into these two buckets. Um, I would also say that counties, because they have historically had um, this responsibility for serving the moderate to severe mental health needs of young people, um, they are, have historically had much more experience, in, experience contracting, with, contracting with schools or partnering with schools to deliver school-based mental health. Managed care plans are still new to, um, to, to schools, to figuring out how to get access to their young, young enrollees. Um, I want to make sure that we include Medi-Cal mild to moderate in this conversation because um, many um, community providers like federally qualified health centers that run school-based health centers do contract with Medi-Cal health plans to provide this benefit. Um, and again, just like with the county specialty mental health, a provider must be contracted with a managed care plan to get reimbursed for the, that, the services in that bucket. Whew, Medi-Cal in five minutes. <laughs> um, the third and last funding stream I want to include is the Mental Health Services Act. Um, MHSA provides the state's second largest public funding stream for mental health services in California. This is after Medi-Cal. So it is a big, big um, bucket of money, but it, again, it distributes across the state. Um, funding is distributed to directly to counties, so it goes from the state to counties to, um, uh, and then counties must plan and create and submit 
a three-year plan um, for how they are, what their, what their funding priorities look like and what they are using their MHSA dollars to support. Um, there is one of the categories in MHSA, MHSA has five funding categories. I'm going to highlight one of them. Um, the funding category is prevention and early intervention. And it really, um, the PEI dollars are really meant to support strategies that reduce negative outcomes um, that might result from untreated mental illness. So it does, the MHSA mentions school failure or dropout. Um, so there, and a lot of counties are leveraging their MHSA dollars to, to partner with schools um, to, to build out um, the supports around some of those intensive, more targeted interventions. So some examples that I want to throw out because I think it's helpful to understand um, what this might look like. Um, so an example is a, a county might give funding to a, a county, so a county behavioral health department might give funding to a county office of education to train school districts in that school districts in that county. So they might train on PBI, PBIS, might train on mindfulness, mindfulness, trauma informed schools, mental health first aid. Those are just some examples of, of arrangements I've seen. Uh, some counties support school district, so directly fund positions in school districts that coordinate dr district-wide behavioral health support. So they might be a community schools coordinator or a behavioral health consultant, so it's somebody that sits and helps provide some leadership around referrals and consultation overlapping maybe with some of the training you can help provide to school staff. Um, and then I've also seen some counties use MHSA to supplement a, a, a Medi-Cal contract that they're giving a provider so that com provider can see non-Medi-Cal or uninsured students. So making sure you can serve all the students. Um, so delivering the same spectrum of services that you would a Medi-Cal student um, but sort of supplementing, supplementing um, your specific medical contract. I'm going to move on to school funding, um, and hopefully there will be time. But again, if you have any questions about any of these in specifics, um, I, my contact will be at the end, and feel free to reach out to me. Um, so school funding, just going down the list. Um, the first one is ERMS. You might have heard of ERMS in, before. This stands for Educationally Related Mental Health Services. Um, ERMS funding is a combination of state and federal dollars um, that are restricted for mental health services to students in special education. Um, this is funding that goes to um, special education local plan areas, SELPAs. Um, which disperse, which can disperse those dollars to school districts. Arrangements between school districts and SELPAs vary dramatically across the state. Um, eligible students, um, so students have, these are students, this goes to services for students with individual education plans who demonstrate behavioral health issues um, that impact their ability to learn and access the school cu curriculum. The second one I'm going to cover is the LEA Billing Option Program. This is a reimbursement program for schools. Um, so schools can get reimbursed for the federal share, that's 50% in California, of health assessment and treatment services provided to Medi-Cal eligible students. So schools can directly draw down Medi-Cal dollars for half of um, the cost of what they are providing. So this is services, um, eligible behavioral health services include psychology, counseling, and psychosocial assessments. Um, so this, this can support schools in directly hiring MFTs, LCSWs, school counselors, if they are providing eligible services to Medi-Cal students. Um, Quick caveat, this used to be limited to students with um, IEPs, it used to be limited to special education, um, uh, special education students, and the state is very, very, very close um, to 
uh, finalizing a state plan amendment that will lift that requirement. So this can go to services for all um, Medi-Cal students. Uh, the second one is the local control funding formula. This is called, this is um, LCFF, if you've heard that. This is per student funding for public schools. So each, each district, each um, LEA in California receives a base grant per student um, that's enrolled, plus additional supplemental and concentration grants for targeted students um, and those are students that are low income or foster youth or English language learners. One thing to note is LCS, LCFF goes to fund everything in public schools. So it is, um, you can kind of think of it as uh, a block of dollars that schools go and now school districts have to figure out how they are going to fund all the things that they need to. So this includes teacher salaries, textbooks, new curriculum, um, although we know that more and more schools recognize their students' behavioral health needs and are using it um, to, to um, invest in mental health infrastructure and services. And the last one, it's a lot of information, um, but the last one is the Every Student Succeeds Act, um, ESSA. This is federal funding. Um, this this was an act that replaced No Child Left Behind. Um, there are two sections in this federal law, um, Title I and Title IV, that promote investments beyond academically focused learning support. So school districts, based on a formula that I could not rattle off the top of my head, school districts in California receive um, a sort of a supplement, a lump, lump dollars um, through ESSA to invest in a many, many different things, and Title I and Title IV do specifically lift up um, investments such as social-emotional learning, positive behavioral interventions, trauma-informed practices, school climate, counseling, health services. Um, so it's, it's really a broad bucket um, by which schools can, can leverage these dollars, these federal dollars. Um, the last two funding streams, LCFF and e ESSA, um, are very flexible funding sources. So if you're thinking about how I kicked off this conversation around how do you leverage your flexible funding to build out the supports around your more restricted funding, I was talking, about, I was talking very much about these two. Um, I also think MHSA can be leveraged to help support um, build out around your restricted funding. Um, so I encourage schools and their partners to think about um, using, um, invest, again, building out around your restrictive funding. So investing in staff time to build partnerships, developing school climate programs, um, providing teacher consultation around trauma-informed um, classroom practices, um, supporting a peer health educational program or peer leadership program that, that um, supports young people in, in healing and thriving. Um, so those are just a couple examples off the top of my head. And I am almost done with the heavy contact content. Because this is new, because it is particular around trauma, um, I also wanted to share that there is new funding available in the state of California. We have a, a new program called ACES Aware in California. This is, initiative, this is an initiative between um, the Department of Healthcare Services and the State Surgeon General's Office. The purpose is to increase trauma screenings for Medi-Cal patients in primary care settings. Um, so they, the, in, the intention is really how do you in, increase screening of children and adults um, in primary care settings. Um, exciting, it is, there is a $29 supplemental payment that is available to Medi-Cal providers if they use a particular tool to screen their pediatric patient, patients. And then after July 1st, um, providers must complete a training um, to continue receiving the supplemental payment. Um, so you have to be a Medi-Cal provider. Um, it has to be with a Medi-Cal patient. Um, 
the intention is in primary care settings. And there's more information that you can find on their website, um, but because it is particularly around trauma screening, and um, we acknowledge, and I know that the State Surgeon General acknowledges, and DHCS all acknowledge that screening for trauma is one step. It's not meant to be the solution or um, the uh, silver bullet, for lack of a better metaphor, um, but it's 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 a step in identifying trauma, and um, there's a lot more support that the state will be rolling out with their partners, and how do you build out a net support once you have identified folks that have experiences of trauma. As I alluded to, this is scratching the surface. Um, but we have a whole toolkit that goes into detail in all of those um, public funding streams. So I encourage you, if you're left with more questions than answers, which is totally reasonable, <laughs> um, I definitely encourage you to check out that toolkit. Um, and then we have a website which has a lot of school mental health resources. Um, we are almost at time. I apologize. I don't know if we will have time to answer questions, but um, I'm happy to stick around after to, um, I don't know if Santoy is able to, but we'll stick around to see if there are any questions. Really quickly before we conclude, I want to make sure that you all know that um, we have a conference coming up May 14th and 15th in Sacramento. We have a lot of school mental health content that we are including, so I encourage you to um, go onto our website and, and um, look at registering and register. Um, early bird ends at the end of March, um, so now's the time. Um, and then I will conclude with our final um, slide that has my email email on there and Santoy's, um, you are welcome to reach out to us if you have any questions um, after this. And we'll stick around. If you want to type in a question in, uh, into the chat or Q and answer box, um, we'll stick around and answer those questions. But thank you so much for joining us on our um, quick <laughs> one hour webinar, scratching the surface of a lot of these topics. Um, Thank you. Yes, and yeah. thank you all for your commitment to school-based mental health. Uh, really appreciate it. It makes a difference. Yes. Someone just asked a really quick question if we will be sending out the slides. Yes, we will be sending out the slides and the recording of the webinar um, in the next week or two.